Small submarines are a fairly popular topic as far as secret weapons are concerned. The Japanese examples are pretty well known thanks to the reevaluation of USS Ward. They were hardly the only example, however. Even in the Japanese Navy, there was more than one type of midget submarine. And in the European theater, the Royal Navy would develop successful examples of their own. These were the X-Class, more commonly known as X-Craft. In contrast to their Japanese counterparts, these were not intended to sneak into harbors and torpedo unsuspecting enemy ships. These were, instead, more similar to Italian frogmen. The X-Craft were intended to sneak into a port and deposit explosive charges beneath their target before escaping from the danger zone. And while they did that task well, they would also serve in a less direct combat role. A role that was arguably just as important, but largely forgotten. I will, of course, cover both direct combat and guidance roles in this video. To begin, as I said before, the X-Class was intended to fulfill a similar mission as the Italian Frogman operations, the most famous of which being the raid on Alexandria in December of 1941. This saw severe damage to HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Valiant in particular. This put two British battleships out of action, and it also drove home how dangerous such an attack could be. The British were not by any means blind to the potential, so they began their own experiments. These would eventually culminate in both manned torpedoes, the Chariot Project, and in midget submarines. The latter are what we're focusing on today, so let's look at the technical details. The X-Craft were, as designed, slightly smaller than their Japanese counterparts. Displacing 27 tons on the surface and 30 tons submerged, these submarines were only 51 feet, 15.6 meters long. With a small beam of around 6 feet, 1.7 meters, the four-man crew was stuffed in rather like uncomfortable sardines. This was not helped by the fact the submarine carried a 42 horsepower diesel engine and a 30 horsepower electric motor. This allowed for a surface speed of 6 knots and an admittedly meager 2 knots when running submerged on electric power. While admittedly impressive considering the low power, these submarines were not breaking any speed records. As for the weaponry, as mentioned earlier, these little submarines didn't carry torpedoes. Instead, they carried two detachable explosive charges. These charges, roughly two tons of high explosive each, are where the distinctive bulges on an X-Craft come from. The Amatol charges were intended to, much like a modern torpedo, break the keel of a target ship from the explosive pressure and its aftereffects. With this design in hand, the British set about building a small number of X-Craft. Twenty would be built, in all, between various subclasses, from the experimental X-3 and X-4 to the series produced X-5 through X-10, and then the improved X-20 through X-25, alongside six XT-class training submarines. The first of these, X-3, entered service in September of 1942, soon joined by X-4 in October. These were primarily used for training crews for the serial production models, which were largely similar other than a reworked interior to allow for carrying a diver and airlock. The training process would continue as the first of these production models entered service. However, it would not last long before they were called to action. With training largely complete by late 1943, the X-Craft were assigned their first combat mission. This came in September, when the first six serial models were assigned to attack the battleship Tirpitz. X-5 through X-10 were rigged up to mother submarines, which towed them in the direction of Norway. Unfortunately, things would not be easy on the British here. In heavy seas, X-9 broke her tow line on the way to the target. She was lost with all hands. X-8, meanwhile, developed leaks at her explosive charges, forcing the submarine to jettison them. They promptly exploded, causing so much damage that she had to be scuttled. So what had begun as a raid by six midget submarines was down to four before it had even reached its target. The remaining four X-Craft broke off from their motherships on September 20th, 1943. They would begin their attack on the evening of September 22nd. While there was an intention to hit Scharnhorst and Tirpitz, the former was on exercises at the time. 
As such, the British focused all their efforts on Tirpitz. Efforts that would, in the end, only amount to two of the X-Craft being able to drop their payload. X-10 had to abandon the attack because of mechanical trouble, which led her to return to her mothership. She would also break her tow line and be scuttled on the way back to Britain. Meanwhile, X-5 disappeared during the attack, though exactly what happened to her is something of a mystery. She was most likely spotted on either her approach or her attempt to return to her mothership. The Germans promptly sank her with one of Tirpitz's 105mm guns, though this isn't completely verified. Just like it isn't entirely clear if X-5 succeeded in dropping her own charges. There is some argument she did, but also evidence she did not. What can be said for sure is that X-6 and X-7 were able to plant their own charges beneath Tirpitz. Both of the X-craft were sighted after they did so, and the crew were forced to abandon them. Captured by the Germans, they informed the battleship's captain about the explosives. He attempted to move the battleship, but this failed. In spite of the amount of explosives planted beneath her, Tirpitz was only, and I'm using air quotes here, heavily damaged. This damage resulted in the battleship taking on 1,400 tons of water, in addition to damage to her machinery. Specifically, Tirpitz had her fuel tanks damaged, her plating and bottom torn up and dented in, and some of her turbo generators flooded, among other various bits and pieces of damage. The result would see Tirpitz unable to return to Germany and out of action for repairs. Repairs that would take until April 1944. A follow-up attack by Lancaster bombers would finish the battleship off in November of the same year. Although every single X-craft used in the attack was lost, their efforts crippled the most powerful German battleship for half a year. That is something to be proud of. Following that operation, however, the X-craft were used for less showy missions. This second batch, X-20 through X-25, were more advanced than the previous set. Their capabilities were broadly similar, however, as was their first mission. Like their predecessors, these X-craft were assigned to a target in Norway. X-24, the one that actually undertook the mission, would end up needing two tries at that target. She was assigned to sink a floating dry dock in Bergen. However, the first attempt in April of 1944 failed. Well, it failed to sink her actual target. Instead, X-24 managed to sink a 7,500-ton German freighter that had the misfortune to be moored alongside the dry dock. Success, I suppose, but not the intended target. As such, a repeat performance on September 11th, 1944, would see X-24 return to Norway. This time she hit the right target, sinking the dry dock with her charges. This was the last time the X-craft were used on targets in Norway. Their remaining missions for the war were an important one, but ones that didn't require them to use their explosives. The first of these, in January of 1944, saw X-20 assigned to the French coast. The crew of the submarine lurked off the coast from January 16th to the 21st, taking pictures and soil samples of the planned landing beaches in Normandy. This was a risky mission in a lot of ways, but also a very important one, because it helped to figure out what conditions could be expected for the invasion of France. This survey was primarily focused on Omaha Beach, which the crew surveyed over the course of two nights. Another operation was intended for Sword Beach, but the worsening weather and the crew's exhaustion led to that being cancelled. Still, this was a highly important operation, even so. Equally important, then, would be the next time the X-Craft visited Normandy. X-20 returned, joined this time by X-23, to take up position off Sword and Juno beaches. They arrived five days before the initial June 5th date of Operation Overlord. The submarines were intended to remain off the coast and do double duty. Keep an eye on the Germans, and also act as navigation markers for the invasion force. This required the crews to stay submerged for the entire day, only surfacing briefly at night. In the cramped little X-craft, this must have been torture. And to make matters worse, the invasion was delayed to June 6th, pushing the crews to the absolute limit of what they carried. But they did it anyway. 
X-20 and X-23 remained on station before in the early morning hours of June 6th, raising navigation mass. These pointed brilliant lights out to sea, serving as a beacon for the landing craft. They served brilliantly in this role. It was also the last role they would serve in. They weren't sent out on combat operations again for the rest of the war, and they were scrapped shortly after it ended. Only one of them, X-24, remains today, in the Royal Navy Submarine Museum. Although improved models, the XE class, undertook operations in the Pacific, but that's for another video. For now, I'll end this one off with a humorous image. There was apparently an incident where one of the X-crafts sailed down Scapa Flow by HMS King George V. At the time, the King was aboard for a visit. So the crew of this tiny little submarine blew a whistle call to salute the King. Which would, of course, require everyone, King George included, to turn and salute the little midget submarine as she sailed past the massive battleship. Quite the amusing image, isn't it? Thank you for watching, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.